What if I'm doing my best, but it just doesn't seem good enough? How do I help the people that I love who seem to be falling away from the Lord? If you relate to these two questions, you're going to love today's conversation as we dive into sections 111 through 114 of the Doctrine and Covenants and learn some of the history behind these sections and a few key ways to keep ourselves from being tricked or completely wiped out spiritually and temporally by the challenges of living in the last days, including a few words from General Conference this past weekend. I'm excited to learn together with you in another great conversation. Hi everyone, welcome to the Hope in Christ podcast, a weekly conversation following the Come Follow Me curriculum of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where we dive deeper into the scriptures and use them as a launching pad for relevant conversations to help us all live Christ's gospel, survive living in the last days, rediscover how we fit into God's plan, and increase our hope and faith in Jesus Christ as we work to prepare the world for His return. I'm so glad you're listening and sincerely hope you enjoy the show. Wasn't the general conference this last weekend absolutely perfect? It is incredible to me, and I still just can't get over how perfect each general conference is for the specific time period in which it's given. None of the topics in this conference were assigned, and yet they all touched on some of the very same doctrines This, to me, emphasizes how much the Lord wants us to understand some key truths and how much He really loves us and is caring for us and helping us from being tricked by the adversary and helping us to know how to get home and how to face the challenges of living in the year 2021 and 2022. I hope that you've been able to take from that conference a lot of impressions uh, that you received personally. I hope you were able to hear the voice of the Lord and I hope that you'll study those talks. We will be using a lot of the talks from that conference throughout the next six months in these podcast episodes, including in today's podcast episode. So let's dive in. We've just come off of one of the single greatest events in the lives of many of the members of the church in Kirtland, the Kirtland Temple Dedication. A few years ago, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf quoted President George Q. Cannon, who he was a member of the First Presidency, when he said, Every foundation stone that is laid for a temple and every temple completed lessens the power of Satan on the earth and increases the power of God and godliness. With every temple, the power of God increases, the power of Satan decreases. Well, what does that mean for Satan? It means he's going to step up his game. After every time something great happens, particularly after a temple is dedicated, Satan, no doubt, will try to get his licks in sooner or later and will try to rile things up and stop the work from progressing. Whether that means keeping us from going to the temple now that it's dedicated or distracting us, he will try to stop the work. And sometimes some people give in and become a thorn in the side of the church at times, but the church will continue on. It will be, as Daniel prophesied, that stone cut without hands, which will fill the earth, and no unhallowed hand can or will stop it from progressing. So with the temple now dedicated, and having received the endowment of power from the Lord and visions and heavenly manifestations, we're now about to enter a particularly difficult time for the church. Over the next three years, from 1836 to 1839, These years will try the church members like a refiner's fire, one of several that they will have faced or will yet face in their lifetimes. They're now left with a great deal of debt. In 1836, the church had tens of thousands of dollars of debt from the construction of the temple, from earlier land purchases, and most of the assets held individually by church members was just the land that they purchased to build their homes on. At that time, there just wasn't much liquidity among church members or for the church itself. And it wasn't a matter of poor cash management. It's just that the church was land rich, but cash poor. Part of this had to do with when the saints in Missouri were ejected and forced out of their homes in Jackson County in Independence. They had to fund the purchase of new land and building of new homes. And so there's a lot of debt in the church at that time. And now, after they'd rebuilt their homes in Clay County, Missouri, 
they're now being legally pushed by the courts from those homes with no hopes of soon reclaiming their properties back in independence where they were commanded to build Zion. They're now going to need even more money to build properties once again and a new place in order to build homes. So there's a lot of stress and all of this is very much on the mind of Joseph Smith. And it was at that time that a brother Burgess, a member of the church, arrived in Kirtland and told Joseph Smith about a large sum of money that he knew was hidden in the cellar of a home in Salem, Massachusetts. So soon after, Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Hiram Smith, and Oliver Cowdery all took off to New York City to meet with some of the church's creditors. And a few days later, They traveled up to Salem, Massachusetts. This is late July 1836. They traveled up to Massachusetts, and Brother Burgess met them there. But he'd stated that the city had changed so much since he had last been there that he was unable to find the house that contained the treasure, the money. So Brother Burgess departed shortly thereafter, and on August 6th, 1836, while they were all, the rest of them were still in Salem, Joseph Smith received the revelation that is now recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 111. In this section, the Lord alluded to other purposes that he had for them in this city. Notwithstanding the rather foolish reason they got them there in the first place, he said that he has treasure for them there, and there are more treasures than one, and people there that he will gather in due time. They were instructed to form acquaintances in that city as led by the Holy Ghost. And in time, the treasures of that city will belong to the church, referring to the treasure of souls. Then he gives them words of comfort concerning their debts, reassuring them that he will give them power to pay their debts. Shortly after this revelation was received, they all left. They went back home to Kirtland. But five years later, Hiram Smith feeling that it was the appropriate time to spread the gospel among the people of Salem, Massachusetts, gave a handwritten copy of this revelation in section 111 to Erastus Snow and encouraged him to go to Salem. So he and Benjamin Winchester began preaching the gospel in Salem and had very little success. Well, Benjamin Winchester left the area And Erastus Snow continued to hold public meetings there, where he would be heard singing the hymns and teaching the gospel. Well, after a few months, Erastus finally found individuals who were sincerely interested in the restored gospel. One of the very first couples baptized by Erastus Snow were Nathaniel and Susan Ashby, among dozens of others over the next several months. Nathaniel Ashby, who happens to be my fourth great-grandfather, allowed Erastus Snow and his wife to live in one of their homes in Salem rent-free for two years. This was a great support for the church. It was a great blessing for Erastus and his family, but also for the church. While he was there, Erastus Snow was able to build the church in that area and the surrounding areas and create branches of the church there. And eventually, Nathaniel and, and Susan Ashby gave Erastus Snow $500 to buy a lot back in Nauvoo, which would be on the corner of Parley and Hyde Streets there, and then even more money to build a home there. So Elder Snow built a duplex there on that property, and eventually, a few years later, Nathaniel and Susan's family moved to Nauvoo, and both the Snow family and the Ashby family lived together in this duplex. And it happens to be one of the most well-preserved buildings in Nauvoo today, and is still owned by the church. At one time, it was uh, ho- it housed sister missionaries that were there in Nauvoo. And I believe now the church is restoring that, and uh, and will be a- you'll be able to take tours of that home. At that time, uh, now living in Nauvoo, the Ashby family contributed money to build the Nauvoo Temple. And so you see how even just one family, the Lord had, cre- had prepared people in Salem to make great contributions to the building up of the church, to the supporting of the apostles and the building of temples. And being one of the descendants of Nathaniel and Susan Ashby, I have to say that whenever I find out I'm related to someone, about half the time it's through Nathaniel and Susan Ashby. There are so many descendants in the church today that are continuing to build up the the kingdom of God. So this revelation received there now in section 111, though it may not have resulted in much for Joseph that weekend in 
Salem, it did result in great blessings for the church eventually. So what lessons can we learn from this experience? How many times have you simply just done your best, and yet with your meager offering, the Lord is willing to give you so much more? If you're trying your best, but are at times afraid that you aren't enough, and that you even feel lost along the way, or feel that your efforts result in failure, the Lord is always willing to make something out of us. Earlier last year in 2020, Elder David A. Bednar spoke to all the church's religious educators. These are seminary and institute teachers and all the BYU religion teachers. And he said these words, If we are doing our best and striving to be consecrated and devoted, we're not going to influence others inappropriately. Heaven is in charge of this work, not you and me. As a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, I have assignments all the time that I know I cannot possibly do on my own. As you do your best, you are enlarged and magnified. You will not always know consciously when the right time is. Just do your very best. President Hinckley often taught it all just works out. And I believed that, but I still thought, come on, there has to be more than that. The older I get, the more I understand that is the only answer there is. God will not leave you alone as you try to succor, nurture, and minister to his children. If you do your best, acting in righteousness, it will work out, and you will learn lessons along the way. That's the end of Elder Bednar's quote. Think about Joseph and and his companions. They go out to Massachusetts seeking for a treasure, (laughs) this hidden treasure. It seems so silly, and yet they're concerned about something that is important to them. They want to pay their debts off. The Lord had commanded them to pay their debts off. And so they go out there with good intentions on kind of a silly whim, and yet the Lord says, I'm still going to do great things with you here. You're not here for, for buried treasure. You're not going to find money in a house. But I have something even better for you. And I'm going to make something great of you and of your efforts, even though you, it wasn't going to result in what you thought. But you gave it your best. And the Lord will always do that with all of us. Going on to this next section, have you ever felt angry? Have you ever felt frustrated, jealous, or offended? What about angry with something that the prophet has said that you feel you strongly disagree with? Joseph Smith now returns from Salem, Massachusetts to Kirtland with the idea of forming the Kirtland Safety Society. This would raise money to help the church pay its debts. They would sell stock in the Safety Society to raise capital, and they would lend that money out to individuals as loans and make money on interest so they could pay off the church's debts. Well, Joseph invested thousands of his own dollars into the Kirtland Safety Society, and other church leaders also contributed significantly. After a while of issuing these banknotes and stock in the Kirtland Safety Society, a man in the area named Grandison Newell, who loathed the prophet Joseph Smith, started collecting banknotes. He thought that if he were to collect banknotes and basically do a run on the bank, go and demand that they be redeemed for gold and silver coins, that it would deplete the assets of the Kirtland Safety Society and the society would fail. He went around buying up these banknotes and eventually did ask to have them redeemed for gold or silver coins, which did put a strain on the assets of the Kirtland Safety Society. Well, Joseph Smith and others continued to pray earnestly for more investors so that this would not fail. There was very little success that started coming from the Kirtland Safety Society, and that was due to hesitation of some people to invest in something that hadn't been proven, and also due to the malintentions of Grandison Newell. And at the same time, there was a nationwide economic panic that hit so many banks across the country. Many of them were calling their loans and stopped issuing loans altogether. And some of them had even failed. The banks were closing their doors permanently. Well, all of this taking place at the same time was a perfect storm for the saints. And the Kirtland Safety Society did begin to fail. And a lot of people were losing money, and they weren't able to pay off their debts. And this caused rifts among the members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and also among other church leaders and church members. Some of them chose to lay aside their own testimonies of Joseph Smith's prophetic role, 
testimonies they themselves had declared that they received by the power of the Holy Ghost. And instead, were now choosing to believe that because this Kirtland Safety Society was failing, regardless of the national crisis, it must have been evidence that Joseph was not a prophet. So, many men from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles fell against the prophet Joseph Smith. And even Oliver Cowdery felt that the prophet was getting too involved in matters that didn't seem to him to be of a spiritual nature. And Oliver, too, started to distance himself a bit from the prophet. Well, meanwhile, Joseph Smith sent Apostle Heber C. Kimball and Orson Hyde to England to share the gospel. And during the summer of this next year now, 1837, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Brother or Elder Thomas Marsh, arrived from Missouri in hopes of gathering his quorum. He noticed that there was a rift in his quorum and he wanted to gather the quorum together. And some had been living in Missouri, some were in Kirtland, and he wanted to gather them in hopes that they would be reconciled to each other and to the prophet. But when he arrived, he found out that one of the twelve had moved away. Elder McClellan had moved away, and some of the twelve were so angry with the prophet that they refused to be reconciled with him. And Thomas Marsh himself felt that Joseph Smith was out of line in sending a few members of the Twelve to England without his permission, since he was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. So he sought counsel from Joseph Smith, and the result of that counsel is now section 112 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let's walk through just a couple of things in this section. Now, you'll notice from your own study of this section that the Lord has a lot to say to Brother Marsh. But we're going to focus on just a couple for the purposes of our conversation today. Right off the bat, the Lord acknowledges that he loves Thomas by saying, I've heard your prayers. And so immediately Thomas feels the love of the Lord. Then in verse 2, he acknowledges something that's going to be a kind of a thread woven throughout this section. It's a warning to Thomas Marsh. He said, Verily I say unto you, there have been some few things in thine heart and with thee with which I the Lord was not well pleased. But if you will abase yourself, you'll be exalted, and all your sins are forgiven. So let your heart be of good cheer before my face, and thou shalt bear record of my name. And then he goes on, but he gives him some warnings. He builds him up. He tells him about the grandeur of his calling and the, the glory of his responsibilities as the president of the Twelve and the keys that he has as the president of the Twelve. But that thread of warning that he weaves throughout this section, in verse 10, you notice he said, Be thou humble, and the Lord thy God shall lead thee by the hand, and shall give thee answer to thy prayers. He said, I know your heart. I know about your prayers about the quorum. I know that you want them to to be reconciled and to love each other. And so continue to pray for them. If you know people who are falling away, continue to pray for them. If you're faithful and humble, the Lord will help you. And he will help them and he will reach out to them. In fact, he even said in this section that after their temptations and their tribulation, because when they give into temptation, of course, they're going to experience some tribulation. But some tribulation comes even without giving into temptations. But he said, after their temptations and much tribulation, behold, I, the Lord, will feel after them. I'll, I'll go after them. I'll reach out to them. And if they harden not their hearts and stiffen not their necks, so if they'll let me, they shall be converted and I will heal them. I think that's a pattern the Lord uses with all of us. If we will let him, he will save us. He will do everything that he can to help us. But we have to let him. That requires dropping our pride at the door. It requires uh, putting on a cloak of humility. It requires allowing him to lead us and not being so high-headed and stiff-necked that we feel like we're the only ones that know or feel like that we know better than the Lord what we should do or how we should act or the things we should participate in or use our time doing. We have to let him. And as soon as we do, he will help us. He will heal us and, and we'll be converted to him. Once again, he goes on to say, exalt not yourself. And this advice in verse 15, rebel not against my servant Joseph, for verily I say unto you, I am with him, and my hand shall be over him. So he does tell 
Brother Marsh that he's an important man. He has a key role in the kingdom. Uh, he says in verse 16, Thou art the man whom I've chosen to hold the keys in my kingdom as pertains to the twelve. And you have a great calling and great responsibility down in verse number 33. But he tells him over and over, you need to humble yourself. Don't exalt yourself. Don't think too much of yourself. And don't fight against my prophet. And with this word of warning, it seems as though Thomas Marsh didn't really hear those, those cries of warning. He did hear how great his calling was. He did hear how wonderful it is to have the keys and how important he was in that role of building up the kingdom as the president of the twelve. So he's entering dangerous ground where he, he believes in the goodness that he has in, inside of him and he knows that he's meant for great things but he's forgetting that element of humility. And that's going to cause him some problems in the days ahead. Now, I don't know about you, but I have had moments, I've had Thomas Marsh moments, where we as as millennials, as a rising generation, as an old generation today on the earth, have all been told since we were young that we were reserved for this time. We've been told that we will do unprecedented things, that we will hold roles and responsibilities and callings that were unprecedented in the world and in the church to help usher in the the second coming and prepare the world for the second coming of the Savior. We've been told that, how, how wonderful we are and that we are reserved. Well, that's true. But as Elder Bednar has said multiple times on occasions when I've heard him speak, he said, I wish we'd stop saying it and start treating people that way rather than just telling them how wonderful they are. Treat them that way. Expect more of them. Because if we were sent here with so much expectation, if Thomas Marsh was sent here with so much expectation, then we need to perform. We have a lot to do. We have great trust that's been placed in us. But it's impossible to fulfill the role, the role that we've been sent here to fill if we are high-headed and think too much of ourselves because we start to lose our way and we start to believe in our own greatness above the greatness of God. And we start to trust in ourselves more than we trust in God. Have you ever had that happen before? Have you ever had an impression that you were to uh, have a specific role or even just a great role in carrying out the work of the Lord? Or have you ever had uh, it said to you that you would be a great leader in the church or a patriarchal blessing that promised that you would do important things in helping the work of the Lord progress? When you have those things, that can be a great blessing, but it can also be kind of a burden because now you, you know that the Lord expects a lot of you. And sometimes I think we, we start to figure out for ourselves what we think the Lord meant by that and where we're supposed to serve and how we're supposed to serve. And we start to take matters into our own hands rather than let the Lord play it out as he wants to, according to his plan, we start to make assumptions that we know better than the Lord. And I think that we get into a lot of danger doing that. I know that I have in the past. And this this uh, lesson of humility it can't be overemphasized. Let's go back and look at what happened to Thomas Marsh. And years later, Thomas's wife and another sister in the ward who were friends decided that they wanted to each make cheese, but neither of them had enough cows to produce the milk they needed for their cheese. So they decided to share and trade milk with each other. Well, in doing so, they agreed that they wouldn't take the strippings off the top of the milk, the cream part of the milk, and that they would share all of it with the other sister. Well, apparently Thomas's wife had removed the strippings And that caused a little rift between the two of them. It ended up in a bishop's council, and the bishop's council decided that um, Thomas's wife was at fault and that she should have left the strippings on. Well, they appealed that, and they took that to the high council. Well, the high council also agreed that Thomas's wife was at fault. Well, Thomas was very offended by this and took it to Joseph Smith in the first presidency, for another appeal, but the first presidency affirmed the earlier decisions that Thomas's wife really was at fault here. Well, Thomas took that very personally, and he even decided that he would defend his wife even if it cost him his soul. And so he started fighting against Joseph Smith and the church, and ultimately ended up signing an affidavit charging Joseph Smith with treason. Now, this affidavit led to Joseph Smith's incarceration in Liberty Jail and the extermination order that drove 15,000 saints from their homes. And we'll talk more about those events in another episode. 
But Thomas Marsh did end up losing his membership in the church and was excommunicated in 1839. And for nearly two decades, he spent his life outside the church over milk. Just unreal how sometimes we let one little offense or one little thing cause us to completely shut out the Lord, stop hearing his voice, completely ignore the fact that we've had personal witness of the truth, and we're the ones that suffer because of those decisions, and we're our own enemy in that case. Well, nearly two decades later, in 1857, so this actually, this is 20 years now after Section 112 was revealed, Thomas Marsh found himself now joining the saints again in Salt Lake City. Now, they're at a meeting of the church in the Old Bowery, which is uh, now the Tabernacle at Temple Square. And an old man now, Thomas, appeared before the saints, and Brigham Young said to the congregation, Brother Thomas B. Marsh, formerly the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, has now come to us after an absence of nearly 19 years. He is on the stand today and wishes to make a few remarks to the congregation. He came into my office and wished to know whether I could be reconciled to him and whether there could be a reconciliation between himself and the Church of the Living God. He reflected for a moment and said, I am reconciled to the church, but I want to know whether the church can be reconciled to me. He is here, said President Young, and I want him to say what he may wish to, brethren and sisters. I now introduce to you Brother Thomas B. Marsh. Brother Marsh then spoke to the church members that day and said, I do not know that I can make all that this vast congregation hear and understand me. My voice never was very strong but it has been very much weakened of late years by the afflicting rod of Jehovah. He loved me too much to let me go without whipping. I have seen the hand of the Lord in the chastisement which I have received. I have seen and known that it has proved he loved me. For if he had not cared anything about me, he would not have taken me by the arm and given me such a shaking. If there are any among this people who should ever apostatize and do as I have done, prepare your backs for a good whipping, if you are such as the Lord loves. But if you will take my advice, you will stand by the authorities. But if you go away and the Lord loves you as much as he did me, he will whip you back again. Many have said to me, he continued, how is it that a man like you, who understood so much of the revelations of God, as recorded in the book of the Doctrine and Covenants, should fall away? I told them not to feel too secure, but to take heed, lest they also should fall. For I had no scruples in my mind as to the possibility of men falling away. He continued, I can say in reference to the Quorum of the Twelve, to which I belonged, that I did not consider myself a whit behind any of them, and I suppose that others had the same opinion. But let no one feel too secure, for before you think of it, your steps will slide. Earlier that year, Thomas Marsh had written a letter to President Heber C. Kimball from the First Presidency, and said, I deserve no place among you in the church as the lowest member but I cannot live without reconciliation in the twelve and the church whom I have injured. Then he went on to say, The Lord has lost nothing by my, by my falling out of the ranks, but oh, what have I lost? There are a couple of great lessons that I'd like to draw from this situation. The first was also addressed by Elder Del G. Renland in conference this last weekend, and that's about avoiding contention. This all began because of an argument between Thomas's wife and this other sister. Speaking of, uh, of our life today as a spiritual stress test, Elder Renland said, In some instances, the spiritual stress test has shown tendencies toward contention and divisiveness. This suggests that we have work to do to change our hearts and to become unified as the Savior's true disciples. This is not a new challenge, but it is a critical one. When the Savior visited the Nephites, he taught, There shall be no disputations among you. He that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil, who is the father of contention. And he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. When we contend with each other in anger, Satan laughs and the God of heaven weeps. Satan laughs and God weeps for at least two reasons. First, contention weakens our collective witness to the world of Jesus Christ and the redemption that comes through his merits, mercy, and grace. The Savior said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. 
The converse is also true. Everyone knows that we are not his disciples when we do not show love one to another. His latter-day work is compromised when contention or enmity exists among his disciples. Second, contention is spiritually unhealthy for us as individuals. We are robbed of peace, joy, and rest, and our ability to fill the Spirit is compromised. If I am quick to take offense or respond to differences of opinion by becoming angry or judgmental, I fail the spiritual stress test. This failed test does not mean that I am hopeless. Rather, it points out that I need to change, and that is good to know. After the Savior's visit to the Americas, the people were unified. There was no contention in all the land. Do you think that the people were unified because they were all the same, or because they had no differences of opinion? I doubt it. Instead, contention and enmity disappeared because they placed their discipleship of the Savior above all else. Their differences paled in comparison to their shared love of the Savior, and they were united as heirs to the kingdom of God. The result was that there could not be a happier people who had been created by the hand of God. Unity requires effort, Elder Renlund continued to say. It develops when we cultivate the love of God in our hearts and we focus on our eternal destiny. We are united by our common primary identity as children of God and our commitment to the truths of the restored gospel. Let me repeat that last part. We're united by our common primary identity as children of God. I think too often in the world today, we are divided because we take on separate identities and claim we're all different from each other. But unity comes when we acknowledge that we have a common primary identity. We're children of God, and we are committed to the truths of His gospel above all else. Elder Renlund continued to say, In turn, our love of God and our discipleship of Jesus Christ generate genuine concern for others. We value the kaleidoscope of others' characteristics, perspectives, and talents. If we're unable to place our discipleship to Jesus Christ above personal interests and viewpoints, we should re-examine our priorities and change. We might be inclined to say, Of course we can have unity, if only you would agree with me. A better approach is to ask, what can I do to foster unity? How can I respond to help this person draw closer to Christ? What can I do to lessen contention and to build a compassionate and caring church community? I was thinking the other day about how everyone on earth seems to be so opinionated nowadays. And with social media here, my wife was mentioning that with social media, it's so easy to be validated in your personal opinions and to find other people who share in those opinions, which just fuels our frustrations, doesn't it? If we could push aside our own opinions, and and having our own opinion is good, but sometimes we just need to put those opinions aside and allow our priority to be acceptance of people as children of God and commitment to live after the truths of his gospel and to be loving to those who choose to disagree with us. To wrap up Elder Renlund's quote, he said, When love of Christ envelops our lives, we approach disagreements with meekness, patience, and kindness. We worry less about our our own sensitivities and more about our neighbors. We seek to moderate and unify. We do not engage in doubtful disputations. We don't judge those with whom we disagree or try to cause them to stumble. Instead, we assume that those with whom we disagree are doing the best they can with the life experiences they have. I love that line. Let's talk for a second about another lesson we can learn from this experience with Brother Marsh. Picture yourself standing in the same room as President Russell M. Nelson. Picture President Nelson holding on to the end of a string, and picture yourself holding on to the other end of that string, and that string is taut between the two of you. It's pulled tightly. That string connects you to the prophet and binds you to him. That string will keep you safe, will never allow you to be led astray. As long as you keep holding on to that string that's attached to the prophet, you will be prepared for Jesus Christ's return to the earth. In addition to Brother Marsh's experience in trying to revile against the prophet and even signing that affidavit uh, falsely accusing him of treason, 
While in Kirtland in 1837, Brigham Young encountered in the temple a group of apostates. These were members of the church and even members of the Twelve who were plotting against the prophet Joseph Smith inside the temple. And looking back on that experience, Brigham Young said this, I rose up and in a plain and forcible manner told them that Joseph was a prophet and I knew it, and they might rail and slander him as much as they pleased. They could not destroy the appointment of the prophet of God. They could only destroy their own authority, cut the thread that bound them to the prophet and to God, and sink themselves to hell. We have been counseled many times, and even recently in this last general conference by Elder Ronald A. Rasband, to follow God's living prophet. He said, We have a prophet of God on the earth today. Never discount what that means for you. We live in a time when we are tossed to and fro, when spirituality, decency, integrity, and respect are under attack. We have to make choices. We have the voice of the Lord through his prophet to calm our fears and to lift our sights. For when President Nelson speaks, he speaks for the Lord. We are blessed with scriptures and teachings that remind us, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. The most important words we can hear, ponder, and follow are those revealed through our living prophet. I bear witness that I have sat in council with President Nelson to discuss weighty matters of the church and of the world, and I have seen revelation flow through him. He knows the Lord, he knows his ways, and he desires that all of God's children will hear him, the Lord Jesus Christ. For many years we have we heard from the prophet twice a year in general conference, but with the complex issues of our day, President Nelson is speaking much more often in forums, social media, devotionals, and even press briefings. I have observed him preparing and presenting profound revelatory messages that have encouraged more gratitude, promoted greater inclusion of all of our brothers and sisters on earth, and increased peace, hope, joy, health, and healing in our individual lives. President Nelson is a gifted communicator. But more importantly, he is a prophet of God. That is staggering when you think about it, but it is critical to realize that his clear direction will shield us all from the deceit, craftiness, and secular ways gaining momentum in the world today. As we look at the wrapping up of the Kirtland era and we look at this experience of Thomas Marsh, let us take warning to not allow ourselves to become separated from the prophet of God. If we are bound to him, we are bound to God, because he speaks for God, and we've received the promise that the prophet will never lead us astray. I've said it before in past episodes, and I'll say it again. As President Nelson has once taught, there is absolutely no need to put a question mark at the end of a prophet's words. When a prophet speaks, a prophet speaks. Now, going on to the last couple of sections here as we wrap this up. In the, by the beginning of 1838, as many as 300 individuals had restrictions on their church membership or had lost their membership in Christ's church. Some of them were even apostles, 70s, and even witnesses of the Book of Mormon. In January of that year, Joseph Smith received a revelation directing him and the First Presidency to take their families and move west. They, Joseph followed that and ended up in Missouri. Since the saints were told that they had to leave their homes in Clay County, officials in Missouri had decided to establish Caldwell County as a place where the Latter-day Saints could settle undisturbed. Within that county, the saints settled settled in a place called Far West, only about 50 miles northeast of Independence, Missouri. Joseph was also there in Far West on March 14, 1838, He had an informal meeting with a member of the church named Elias Higby and some others where he clarified some of the verses from Isaiah. This is now recorded in section 113 of the Doctrine and Covenants. In section 113, in in the clarification Joseph provided for the verses in Isaiah, he said that there would be a leader that would rise up in the latter days and help gather Israel and that that person would be a descendant of Judah or Jesse 
as well as a descendant of Joseph. So how are you a descendant of both? Well, some people could say that perhaps because of intermarrying um, or because in your family tree you come from multiple lines, and so perhaps one line could be from one tribe and another from another tribe, which is possible. President James E. Talmud, however, had a different take. He is taught that it's possible that they're a literal descendant of Ephraim, but because of the priesthood keys that they would hold, they are a descendant of Jesse or David because of Peter, James, and John restoring those keys, and they were of the house of Judah. And Joseph never claimed that he himself was this person that was referred to in Isaiah, though it's very likely him. And we know Joseph was a descendant of Ephraim, and he did receive the keys from Peter, James, and John who were of the house of Judah. Joseph Smith also mentioned that this individual who the Lord would call in the last days would hold the power of the priesthood, would redeem Israel, and that in redeeming Israel, or to put on the strength of Israel, it would be to put on the authority of the priesthood. It's interesting that in the temple, um, we wear robes, and they're priesthood robes, and we literally put them on. And so the Lord is blessing us with the ability to see how we can arm ourselves with his power in the temple, um, not just through ordinances, but also by by helping us see that we can literally clothe ourselves in his power. And we walk away at once again with the temple garment, which is another symbol of his power and how we're clothed in that power. And we walk away and throughout life we're protected from temptation and evil. And then in section 114, it's a very short section, um, after Joseph had arrived in Far West, he was approached by Elder David W. Patton, who was second in authority under Thomas Marsh in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And Brother Patton had asked for a revelation, and that's section 114 now. Now, as you read through this section in your personal study, you'll notice that the Lord encouraged David Patton to put all his business in order. Now, that could have meant many things for David Patton, but it's interesting to note that David Patton passed away in a, in a battle with some of the church's opponents there in Missouri only months later after this revelation was given. So the Lord knew that that would happen. Now, he was giving this, this direction to David to put his business in order for perhaps a lot of reasons, but one that the Lord knew was because his life would be ending soon. Imagine how happy Elder Patton would be if he were to accomplish that and obey that counsel when he passed away months later. How comforted he must have felt to know that he had done what the Lord wanted him to do. Later in this section, the Lord also says that uh, inasmuch as there are those among you who deny my name, others will be planted in their stead. And isn't that the case with all of us? We all play key roles in the building up of the gospel, and we can be a major part of the work of the Lord and the work of salvation and exaltation. But the Lord's work will roll on with or without us. It's a privilege to serve and to be a part of this church. As I listened to our prophet speak, and as as I listened to all of the words of General Conference this last weekend, and I hear the choir sing, it just gets me so excited and so happy to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. We ought to be so thankful every day for our membership in this church. So as we wrap up today's conversation, remember, this is the restored Church of Jesus Christ. Remember that He will always make the very best out of your best efforts. And remember that as we connect and tie ourselves to the prophet of God and to God himself, we will never fall. And if we do separate ourselves from the prophet, we step onto dangerous ground and we step there alone. The Lord loves us. He hears our prayers. We have been reserved for this time. We have been trusted. Let's get to work. Let's reach out to each other in unity and love and acknowledge our common primary identity as children of God. I love you all. Thanks for listening in today and for taking the time to subscribe and share this message with people you love. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. You can also find this podcast on YouTube at Hope in Christ, a Come Follow Me podcast, or connect with me on Instagram at Bro Ben Peterson. I'd love to hear from you. And remember until our next conversation, there is always hope in Christ.